Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WDSC, WRPT in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Lee Stewart, Executive Director of CHUM. Lee has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you for joining us today, Lee. Thanks very much for the invitation. Glad to be here. So CHUM is an acronym. Talk about what CHUM actually means. Well, CHUM actually used to be an acronym, and now it's just CHUM, CHUM. because we started out as Central Hillsides United Ministries, then we grew beyond the hillsides, and we became Churches United in ministry, and then Temple Israel joined, so churches was no longer accurate. And so we had a, a process inside the organization to say, what shall we call ourselves? And we voted to call ourselves CHUM, and that's how people know us who use us, the CHUM. And so it is a group of 43 uh, faith communities that have band together for a long, long time, since 1973 originally, to meet some of the basic needs of the people who live here in Duluth. And if you're my chum, mm -hmm. you're my friend. You're my friend. You're, you're gonna help me. We hope so. And some people say, why do you call it that? That's us bait fish, which is another <laughs> use for, for yes. the great, great Lakes here. I said, no, no, we're yeah. the friend type. We're not the bait fish type. Talk a little bit about that idea of communities helping each other. Well, what CHUM's mission is, is people of faith working together to provide basic necessities, foster stable lives, and organize for a just and compassionate community. So the groups that make up CHUM have, have worked really hard to develop that and bring that mission into the forefront. So we provide the basic shel um, emergency shelter, the largest in St. Louis County. We have one of the largest food shelves in St. Louis County. We're hospitable to everyone. We don't turn people away. We're always welcoming. Come in, how can we help you? What's going on? Can we want some coffee? Want something to eat? Uh, very, very dealing with hospitality and the human dignity. We, uh, again, we're one of, the few, one of the few people that don't turn people away. We say, come in. And in doing that, we give the members of CHUM and the congregation of CHUM another basic necessity, which is the ability to be generous and kind, just and merciful. So if it fits those things, then CHUM does it. Part of the gift is allowing people to give, to give of their time, to mm -hmm. give of their generosity, to give mm -hmm. of their openness, to actually engage in a meditation that is about their beliefs. It allows people who, who need help to receive help and that's part and parcel of their benefit. Mm -hmm. It also allows people who have something to give to receive the gift of being able to do something that is meaningful to their lives. I think that's right, and it's really, someone asked me the other day whether people in Duluth were generous to CHUM, and I would have to say yes, absolutely, beyond any kind of, of imagination. Uh, the other day, the uh, vascular center from the hospital brought 16 sleeping bags. Over the course of a year, people donate between three and 400,000 pounds of food to us. We just need to open our mouth and say, here's something that we need, and it comes pouring through our doors. Because people realize there's a level of poverty here, level of homelessness here, and we have to stand together to do something about it. We can alleviate most of the suffering. We're not on a path to ending it but we can certainly make it a lot less miserable for people. So talk about the trauma that is associated with poverty, mm -hmm. because that is also part and parcel of, of what we are experiencing as, as, a, as a society. We know that within the body of our society, there is trauma mm -hmm. that is experienced over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And this is an approach to healing it. Talk about mm -hmm. that idea of trauma and how that affects people here in Duluth and how we are responding to that. Well, that's a, that's a really good question because we've more and more become aware that we need to be trauma-informed in what we do. Uh, we started becoming aware of that when we built the Steve O'Neill Apartments, when we were providing housing and supportive services for families with kids who had been homeless for more than a year or, or recurrently. We realize that tra homelessness is traumatic to everybody, but it's especially traumatic to children. The instability, and then think about being a parent and not being able to take care of your kid and not knowing where you're gonna sleep that night and not knowing where you're gonna get the next food and not knowing any what's gonna happen to you and living out on the streets. It's pretty uh, brutal here sometimes in terms of climate, for example, weather on, on our streets. And so the, th that kind of instant trauma, current trauma, and then because of the vast overrepresentation of people of color, communities of color among those who are very poor and who are experiencing homelessness in our community, we're also dealing with current trauma of racism and historical uh, trauma connected with Native Americans and also with, uh, with long histories of racism. And so we end up having a, a situation where people are in very much a survival mode. We need to meet them where they are 
provide them enough space and support and concern so you can calm that down, slow that down a little bit. And you know, people say, Chum gives people too many chances. Well, we're kind of in that 70 times seven uh, type thing. And what would we, how would we want to be treated? if it were ourselves or our brother. And I can't tell you how many times I'm in the streets of Duluth and someone comes up to me and says, you know, my brother's at Chum right now, thanks a lot. And it's not just people who have the appearance of being poor or the appearance of, of right. being homelessness. It's, it's much, much, much deeper than that. Most of the people who come to Chum for shelter have a disability of some kind, 67% reported disability, most of which is mental illness and then substance abuse or some kind of co-occurring disorder. So that framework of having bad things happen to you. I mean, that's basically trauma-informed. Something happened, it wasn't someone's choice. Right. Something bad happened to them, and now we're making the best we can to get a path back to health and healing. But we have to deal with all of those in, inside the context of, of what, we do with, what we do with people and for people. And we're learning so much about the impact, sometimes multi-generational impact Clearly on multi. our, mm -hmm. uh, at the cellular level, mm -hmm. Uh, from trauma mm -hmm. so that um, when our forebears have received a certain type of behavior over uh, decades, lifespans, sometimes centuries mm -hmm. on a recurring basis, that starts to create shifts. So the so instant healing of even historical trauma is just not possible. No, and it's not, it's silly to even think that we can do it. I mean, we're repairing something that's been going on for hundreds of years right. in most cases. And even when we think about the children and families that live at Steve O'Neill Apartments, it's been going on two or three generations in terms of homelessness itself, in terms of disability, in terms of, eth of the, whether you're African American or indigenous person, those kind of prejudices have shaped your life. But if we have been able to, as a society, imprint that trauma on others, we can also heal it. It just does require a lot of interaction and a lot of patience. Uh, very often we become aware of the depth of the issue when we, we find a solution, we deliver the solution, and we expect that will automatically, like a light switch, solve the problem or a series of problems, and it doesn't. And it's only because our analysis was insufficient. So let's talk a little bit about your approach to healing. Mm -hmm. your approach to delivery of services, because it's not just point solutions. You do have individual uh, solutions to deal with food insecurity and housing need, particularly when it's immediate need, the fact that you never turn anyone away, but you really have created a philosophy which is really more of a way of life, isn't it? One of the things I'm really proud of is the, the way CHUM has always evolved to deal with whatever is emerging in our community today. So the Steve O'Neill Apartments emerged because we were seeing a lot more children in shelter and families who had parents who had been, we knew them when they were children in our shelter again. Mm -hmm. So we were seeing a generational situation. Now we have to do something to help for families with children. And so when we created the Steve O'Neill Apartments, which was an enormous community effort with a big uh, capital campaign drive, partnership with uh, Center City Housing and One Roof Community Housing, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, the county, HRA, many, many others to create the $15 million to build it. But inside that, we said we want to put the children at the center of, life, of, of the community, the well-being of children. When we opened it, we thought we were going to have kids 6 to 12, which was kind of what we'd seen in shelter. It wasn't that. That's not who showed up. Who showed up were much younger mothers with much younger children. So we immediately adapted into an early childhood model for kids from six, from birth to, to five. Uh, we created a trauma-informed child care program, which is licensed by the county, uh, very much on socio-emotional development of those children and of their parents. And then a two-generation look at that. Right. And then a family look at that. And then a community look at that. So at every level, we try to find healing at the individual level, at the family level, and at the community level, and of the Families are living at the Steve O'Neill Apartments now. Some of them have been home, have lived there for over five years, and they were homeless for five years before they moved in there. So it's a tremendous amount. So you talked a little bit about your food program yep. as well, mm -hmm. accepting uh, food donations and then distributing yep. that. Mm -hmm. And that's a logistics uh, issue, right? Because food spoils, you need to get the food to people as quickly as possible, turned around. 
Well, I, I think for an ordinary possible. mortal, it's a, it's a logistics uh, problem, but I have a fantastic director of distributed <laughs> services named Scott Van Dale, who is a master at both procurement and rapid distribution. Uh, before Scott came, we would be happy if we were distributing about 150,000 pounds of food a year. Now that Scott's been with us a couple of years, we would take it as a kind of a personal failure if we were anything less than 300,000. So he's been at pounds, and so he's been able to meet with local suppliers, Bay Produce gives us lots of tomatoes and, and from their hydroponics, uh, the bread companies, meat companies, milk companies, egg companies, all, all kinds of productions. And then we have food shelves, which are open uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and across the city, and so people can come. And, uh, and then if we get too much food, which is possible, and we work with Second Harvest Food Bank, so it's possible right. that they will get too, too much, then we can redistribute to other shelters who don't have food shelves, to youth programs, to board and lodges, which are uh, supportive housing for people. And we, we don't waste, and that's kind of Scott's motto, and he, he's taught me a lot about it. You made reference to disparities that are based often in race mm -hmm. and ethnicity. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about how that informs your programs and your strategies for, for dealing with this really fundamental issue in America. It really is a fundamental issue in America. It's a fundamental issue in Minnesota and Duluth. Uh, uh, we have among the widest disparities in terms of white and non-white populations in the country. And in Duluth, we have about a 22% poverty rate overall. But among Af African American, African heritage, and indigenous people, that could be 50 to 65 percent. So the, po the levels of poverty are much greater in, in, in those communities. And as a consequence, the disparity in terms of education, in terms of housing, in terms of uh, just opportunity is huge. So several years ago, CHUM adopted an equity lens in what we did. And one of the first things we did was say we want to make sure in our programs that we uh, hire people who represent the people that are in our program. We've done that in our shelter and we're getting closer to it at, uh, at the Steve O'Neill Apartments. We also team up to recognize spe specific issues in health disparities and in education. So we were part of a program with Blue Cross Blue Shield called Health and All Policies and the uh, Zeitgeist Center for Arts and Culture created a platform so that the city adopted equity and health as a lens through all their planning in the, in the last uh, master plan that they made that the school district adopted a, an equity lens for any action that they take. So for, for, let's, let's take an example of, of a policy they're supposed to say, who, what's the impact of this policy? Is there a disparate impact? What are we going to do it, about it? Have we involved people who are at that short end of, of who are going to be at the effect of it? And, and so th those are the kinds of things that we do. And then we also uh, are the fiscal agent for any organization that's led uh, by or for communities of color who might not be able to get into the 501c3 mix and might not right. be able to fund. So we're Natives Against Heroin, sev and there's several other organizations we have. We're absolutely able to be the, the fiscal sponsor for that. And that makes a big deal for helping other nonprofits get, you know, smaller ones get on their feet. And then we add our reputation to that, which is really important. And then I can mentor people about the grant writing or the budgeting or the counting or whatever, whatever it is, you know, the, the, how, to, how to form one of these nonprofits. One of the things that I find so fascinating about this part of the, uh, of the problem set that we're all confronting is that when you do the analysis, it is true that the negative impacts of poverty, the negative impacts of lack of education, those are clustered by race. Yes. And then there is this idea that solutions must be race neutral. The problem is characterized by race, but the solutions are, must be race neutral. It seems to me that there's a disconnect. If the problem is characterized by race, then the response needs to be informed by the characterization of the problem. If that is part and parcel of it, how do you ensure that it is not only a matter of, of recognizing that, but how do you ensure that your staff are equipped to actually approach these problems um, on the battlefield in which they are unfolding of race and, and historic disparities and, and currently embedded his disparities in our society? A couple of different ways. One of the things we've done is a whole lot of training on uh, privilege, on what it means, not just among our staff, but among the members of, of the congregations that make up CHUM. You know, what is, white, what is privilege? What is white privilege? What is uh, white privilege? 
white privilege as being, I'm a good example of white privilege. My starting point was way ahead of the starting point of a young baby born at Steve O'Neill Apartments right now. And I had no more choice about where I was born or who my parents were than that baby did. But because my parents both had a college degree and my dad was employed and they, neither of them had mental illness and neither of them were alcoholic or substance use and were able to surround me with love from the, before the moment I was born. And that's the starting line. And people who are and I'm thinking of a little African-American baby in the, the Steve O'Neill apartments now, that baby didn't have that chance. And so that gap there in the starting line, and then I've also, is, what I, is, is how I frame it. And so part, part of my work is to make sure that that starting line gets much more evened out. So the, that from starting the earliest age, you get to the gap. And then an, another way to think about it is the tailwind you didn't know you had. And that's something that white people have to learn, that we had a tailwind, because we're a little bit oblivious to that until, a, we, until we start talking about it and start seeing it. It's a and great so, analogy, because you don't see the tailwind, but you do benefit from right, it. You're right. short, your flights are shorter, you, 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 the, the ride is less bumpy. Yeah. And we have a couple of really wonderful training programs here. Um, uh, uh, Kevin Squira Brown and, and Doug Bowen Bailey and uh, race awareness workshops from the Family Freedom Center. So there's a deep conversation in Duluth because we recognize that we do have, you know, we have an opportunity and we have a challenge here. And another example of how it works when you talk about, um, I'm not so sure that things need to be race neutral. I believe that uh, some things are not. And so if you, if you look at the graduation rates in our schools, there's a lot of con concern because the uh, community, kids of color have about half the, the gradu lower half graduation rate as, as white kids. But if you actually do the, the real analysis behind that, that's only about 30 African American kids and, and 30 American Indian kids. And with those six, if those 60 children whom we can identify, I mean, that's a different problem than saying, oh, it's 50 percent. Right. It's right. 30 children or 50 children. Right. And because of the, the ethnic and racial makeup of Duluth. Duluth is about 90% white. And so the, the populations are small, and yet we can uh, work we can, in, or we can organize through that. I mean, I think if, if, if as a school system we can't address the needs of 50 kids out of 8,000, I mean, that, that's a, a total, it's not like New York City where I was where there's 1.1 million kids in the school system. Right. The real difficulty here is that you want to adhere to two conflicting realities. We have the ideal of how we should be, how we say we are, and then we have the reality of how we, tr we really are. Mm -hmm. And until we are able to hold those two ideas in our heads simultaneously mm -hmm. and really talk it over, those problems end up becoming intractable. The idea of of how do you create understanding really starts with a conversation, doesn't it? Well, sure. And it also, though, I mean, I'm not afraid at all to say, here's the world as it should be, and here's the world as it is. Right. And what do I need to do to get from one to the other? But I'm not so foolish as to think I can do it overnight. And I'm not so sure that I can be, I don't, I'm not a perfectionist at all. I do not want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Right. You know, if we can move, to, move towards something better, something that is more just, more merciful, kinder, more generous, then we should do that. And we, we shouldn't not act simply because we can't get to that far end. Do, is part of our difficulty as a society is that we seem to be um, less willing to deal with long-term intractable problems that require substantial investment over time. And it's much easier to focus on the silver bullet solution. I'll, I'll build a house here, I'll do this, and the problem will go away. Is, is, is part of what we have to do is, is, is change our, our orientation to problem solving in America so that we have a longer horizon. You know, you see business mm -hmm. profit at the end of a quarter as opposed mm -hmm. to a healthy company over time. Mm -hmm. And if the company isn't profitable enough, you split it, across, split it uh, into little pieces and you sell off the pieces, right? So maybe oh, we, yeah. we need to think a little bit differently as Americans. Yeah, I'm not so good about how all Americans think mm -hmm. or how even how all Minnesotans think, but, but I'm pretty good about what I need to do in the corner where I am right now right. and how to extend our time horizon out. And even Minnesota, I recently wrote a little paper about 
what would happen if Minnesota aligned its housing resources with ending homelessness instead of just general housing. Right. We need housing all across the board, no question about that. My preference, let's talk about people experiencing homelessness, preferential option for the poor, they're the ones who need it most. Not exclusively, but most. And I could see that if we, if we did a 15 year project, then we could indeed build the 10,000 units of housing that we would need to deal with the bulk of the people experiencing homelessness now. But we don't, we make a one year policy or two year policy or mm -hmm. priority. And that's, that's frustrating. I'm kind of tired of people talking about ending homelessness but not building any housing. I mean, you can't get there from here if you don't do something about that. Gotta get out your hammers and nails. And, and, and it's difficult in Duluth, we're short four or 5,000 units of housing across all of the economic level. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really, the construction industry hasn't recovered from the recession. We haven't recovered from a huge economic downturn in the 70s and 80s. And how do we build the type of housing that's needed now to keep our economic engine going? You know, I'm on for it. You know, my particular focus though is the people at the very bottom of that. What does the next 10 years look like for Chum? Do you basically have your agenda set in terms of the areas that you're going to focus on and now it's a matter of finding practical programs to deliver on that? Or are you constantly seeking um, a certain part of your investment portfolio to invest in, in new and emerging mm -hmm. problems that you might see today, mm -hmm. but you don't quite have a solution today? Well, I wish we had a great investment portfolio, but I can tell people how invest they should invest theirs. So investment I of time. Yeah, no, no, that? but we are still guided by our mission. So whatever the basic needs is, go is going to be and what it looks like for the long, long term, Mm -hmm. And the ten, not even long term, let's say 10 years, 10 to 15 years, um, we're not going to solve the housing crisis for people with multiple disabilities. Right. And so how can CHOM, and the things I'm thinking about now is, what if we could build a different kind of structure? Emergency shelters were created in the 80s, as you know, for right. the idea that people would stay for a few days and, and then, then be out leave. and they had enough money and they could, $200 or whatever the general assistant was, could buy, rent a house, rent an apartment, not that way anymore. Uh, Three-fourths of the people who are at CHUM now have been homeless many, 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 many times. The only reason they can get housing is someone gets evicted from some other place. So we're not an emergency shelter anymore. So right. my question is, how can we build a different kind of place where people can stay 30, 60, 90, 180 days or maybe longer? Some will be able to say a sober environment, some not so sober. Some a place where there can be treatment for, social, for substance use or mental health if they want. Some a special place for people who are homeless who are discharged from the hospital who need respite care. Another little special place for people who are discharged from jail and they're homeless to help them reintegrate into after incarceration. So kind of thinking about it as a much longer term stay and different kinds of, of services that are needed to meet the people's basic human dignity. So last night at Chum we had 90 people. We're licensed for 50. You know that, and we had another 30 or so people at a warming center on the east side, central side of town, and another 10 or 15 over on the west side of town. Mm -hmm. So that's an enormous number of people who need someplace better to stay. Right. And my approach is, it's got to be better than a bridge. It's got to be better than a tent. It doesn't have to be a quarter of a million dollars for an apartment, which is what it takes to build housing in Duluth right now. Right. So somewhere in between there. There has got to be a middle road. And so I'm talking with the county, I'm talking with the city, I'm talking with my allies, I'm talking with the congregations. Let's rethink this. Chum rethought itself the last two years to be what's called a low barrier shelter. We used to make you have people required to be sober. You don't have to be sober to be at Chum anymore. You can come in if you're using you high, high as a kite. Uh, you can't be threatening, you can't hurt other people, you can't be violent, but you can certainly be uh, under the influence of something. We made special day places so people could sleep that off. We open overnight now so people can come in and out during the night because if they, some people can choose to be in bed, some people are not. So we allow dogs and cats in the, in the shelter now so people will come in. We wanted people to be able to find a, get, get shelter and so we lowered all of the gates that we had and I think we're probably the lowest shelter in Minnesota right now and I'm really lowest barrier shelter in Minnesota now, and I'm very proud of that. But what made that, what happened with that was people who wanted a sober environment, they're, they're sleeping outside now. So we need to make another place for them. Your programs are being informed by your intent 
and not by your preconception. Right, I'm a scientist by training. I spent a long time being a systems ecologist and training about how do systems fit together, what, what, what is controlling the energy flow through right. this thing, what is flowing carbon flow, same as what is flowing money, and what is, what is flowing through homelessness right now. Right. You know, what are the unfulfilled drivers? So the drivers of homelessness is untreated mental illness, lack of housing, uh, trauma, Poverty. low income, racism, stigma against mentally ill people, people with, uh, who are poor, people who are homeless, people who are African-American, people who are indigenous, you know, multiple, multiple black people. So chum job, lower those things, be a welcome place. Lee Stewart, thank you so much for sharing the work of chum. Thank you so much for describing how you address issues of supportive housing, how you address issues of, of homelessness, uh, uh, food insecurity, and thank you so much for your insights. You're welcome. Thank you.